So thanks folks for joining today. Let's do a quick mindfulness activity if you would like. So um, opting in if you would like to. So we're gonna do a mindfulness of breath activity. So you can go ahead and close your eyes or take a soft downward gaze, whichever you prefer. And take a moment to take a breath or two. And for the next minute or so, I'd like you as best you can to just tune into your breath, not trying to change it in any way, just keeping your attention focused on your breath, noticing your in-breath and your out-breath. The mind wandering is normal. You can bring your attention back to your breath. Continuing to tune into your breath. Alrighty, and bringing yourselves back to the room, opening your eyes when you're ready. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lindsay. So hopefully that brief mindfulness, you know, let you try to take a pause on everything else you were doing before and have to do after this hour and just helps us center together. If you're able to turn your cameras on this morning or I guess this afternoon, that's always wonderful. So we can help continue building our learning collaborative. And if you're not able to turn your cameras on, we understand. Today, we are going to be talking about adult-child interaction cycles and tools to improve relationships. We're going to be talking about two specific tools, praise and special time, and then we'll get into a case discussion for today. Okay, so we don't have any disclosures of interest uh, or conflicts of interest for this. We're hoping that by the end of today, you'll be able to connect the theory of adult youth interaction cycles with two tools. And those tools we'll talk about are praise and special time. Apply five guidelines for effective praise and three guidelines for special quality time in that you can use in your practice. And identify four resources for parents or teachers interested in improving relationships with these tools. So to start us off, we want to hear from you all. Um, we'd like to hear a bit about what con common concerns about adult youth relationships you hear about in your work. And so you can give us feedback by following the link in the chat. You can also hold your phone up to the QR code, um, or if you would rather just provide us feedback in the chat, that's fine too. So take a moment to think about and share what common concerns do you hear about the relationships between the youth you work with and their parents, caregivers, or teachers, or other adults in their lives. Okay, respect, privacy, confidentiality. I'm guessing those might be concerns from the youth's standpoint. Anything else people tend to hear? Let's go through an example together. So negative relationships really stem from inter interaction patterns or cycles in which adult and youth influence one another's behavior through a process called negative reinforcement. 
So basically, when a youth exhibits some sort of concerning behavior, um, for example, noncompliance, right, not following directions, and adults respond ineffectively, it creates this cycle, each time escalating in severity or emotional tone. And eventually, we see either the youth or adult complies with the other's demand, which ends the cycle in the short term, but reinforces the ineffective behavior pattern. So let's go through an example. Let's say an adult, a parent, a teacher, uh, gives the youth an instruction, finish your work, right? And then let's say the youth says no. Okay, here's our interactive portion of the of the talk. So what might the adult do next? I've just given the child an instruction and they said no or just ignored me. What might an adult do next? You could Think empathize about- with you could empathize with them and then maybe give them two choices about how the work is going to get done. That is great, Charlene. That's a really effective response. What do you think might be a more typical response, particularly if this is something that's been happening day in and day out when we're not at our best? It's likely that the adult would do some kind of a threat. If you don't do your work, then you'll fail your class or or whatever it is that is happening. Okay, great. So maybe give a threat. I see in the chat, repeat it again in a stern tone or yell or give a consequence. Exactly. We're going to usually, if we're not at our best, we haven't taken a parenting class, say it again louder. Like seriously, get going. Let's say the youth responds at that point. Okay, gets their work done. What does the youth learn then from this interaction cycle? They've learned, well, I don't really have to do something until the adult yells, right? What does the adult learn about what's going to work for them? I have to raise my voice or I have to give a consequence in order for them to do something. Exactly. So they've learned, well, what works is raising my voice or giving a consequence. So I'm going to probably start there next time. I'm going to skip this calm instruction, right? But let's say that you still doesn't respond. So you said, um, you know, what might the adult do? Well, maybe we're going to give a threat, right? If you don't finish your work, you're going to lose all your screens for the whole year, right? Let's say the youth then responds and does it. Again, we've as adults learned that we need to make threats for the youth to follow through. And the adult and the child has learned, I don't really have to follow through until a threat is made, right? But let's say the youth still doesn't respond and we as a parent say, you know what, whatever, it's your grade, it's not my problem, I don't have the time to follow through on this. Well, now what has the youth learned? If I just like keep holding out, I'm going to have to never have to do this, right? And the parent learns, well, I really can't count on my child to do this task on their own, right? And so you can see by the time parents and teachers are coming to you all in your office, they've often had this cycle happening for a really long time. They may be feeling hopeless. They may be not seeing a path out of this cycle, which has really become ingrained. So I, um, oh, great. So we got a lot of responses here about what adult youth relationship Concerns you all are hearing, generational differences, not talking, self-regulation, not being understood, irritability, oppositional, helpless, helplessness right there, right? Communication, cultural differences, strain, connectedness, worried. Great. Thank you all for responding to that. Now I'd like your feedback. This is the second question on the poll. How often do you use these strategies in your work? kind of discussing these cycles like we just talked about, providing tips on effective praise and providing tips on special time. So I'd love for you all to respond to the second question on the Mentimeter or just feel free to to unmute yourselves quickly or put thoughts in the chat.
Let's see, two of them. I heard yesterday that people were having a hard time with the second question on the chat uh, or in the poll. So feel free also to just answer in the chat um, or even just think or reflect to yourself kind of how often do, do you use these strategies in your work? Often. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Okay. So the first tool to improve that relationship cycle that we just talked to is praise, right? And so not all praise is created equal, right? So there are a few things to really help convey to folks about what makes praise most effective in improving relationships. The first is that we're aiming for specific labeling of the positive behavior, right? So um, great job following directions the first time. Right. So uh, rather than saying something vague or really narrowing in on what is the, the negative behavior that we want to see corrected, we're going to give really specific, positive labeled praise. We also are uh, aiming for frequent praise. So five to one praise for every correction. And research has really shown that this ratio is what helps children learn skills at, um, at an effective rate. So I see you getting started on your worksheet. We're not going to end for the perfection of them finishing the worksheet. We're going to give praise right away when we see them starting. And then we want it to be as immediate as soon as possible after the behavior, right? Um, because the reason we do these things is that directs shared acknowledgement of these steps in the right direction, which encourages more effective behavior and responses, so thank you, um, Lyra, for sharing your thoughts in the chat about how sometimes these strategies are difficult to fit the cultural constructs of um, the patient population. It can be challenging for caregivers to adopt. I wonder if um, anyone has thoughts about this or um, has ways that they've tried to fit these principles um, to different cultural contexts. And we can also talk more about this in the case conference. Maybe, Lara, I wonder if you'd be willing to, to volunteer for an example and we could think through it more. But does anyone have, have initial thoughts about that? I mean, I think one thing it always is great is like validating the, the intent of the parent almost always is something protective or like wanting to be helpful. So even if they're doing something that's like a very corrective or critical it's coming from a place of of uh, what their intent is and sometimes that can help um them maybe consider a, a new way of trying with their with their child thanks marielle and amina yeah i have a quick uh, you know question so how do you deal with patients and even parents will say this even as a parent i feel the pa child gives you a look as I know what you're trying to do. You're trying to use this positive praise strategy with me. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, if if parents have fears or maybe they've experienced when they try to use a new strategy like this, that it seems maybe artificial and the child like catches on to what they're doing. Um, one that I have to address that as well as um, Lyra's question is, you know, the praise really can be tailored to what is what is most natural to the parent's style and their cultural context, right? So the way that I give praise might be different than the way Evan gives praise, then Lindsay gives praise, then Marielle gives praise. And that's okay. It The more authentic it is, the more easily the parents are going to be able to do it and the more authentic it's going to seem to the child and even just making small shifts of trying something new um like charlene is saying in the chat trying a new behavior uh, and practicing it and and kind of tweaking it to see uh, what changes happen can be helpful i love how interactive this is this is great I think also building on the authenticity piece, Lauren, in my experience, it tends to be older kids who will point that out. I'm not sure if that's your experience too, Amina. And sometimes I think it can be helpful for parents to be super authentic of like, yeah, I am trying this new strategy that I learned about because I've noticed that the way I've been doing it before isn't so helpful. Like, I'm sorry, it sounds kind of awkward right now. Like I'll work on it. 
That's a great suggestion. To, to, to that, I think just telling them like, yeah, that's right. I am trying to encourage this. <laughs> like, this is not a trick, you know? Yeah, that's great. Um, some other, you know, guidelines that we have are really trying to focus on effort rather than ability, um, because studies show that complementing in this way leads to a mindset. If we if we praise on ability, it can actually lead to a mindset that intelligence and and these qualities are innate or fixed. So basically, you don't have control over them. So why should I try, right? Whereas if we're really focusing on the effort, um, it gives a sense of well, this praise is coming from something that I'm working hard on, right? That I'm in control over. And again, I, I said this in the last slide, but we're really working for progress, not for perfection not perfection. So sometimes even the the youth trying something, even if it didn't have the result you want, we want to praise that because they they tried, right? Maybe just expressing how they felt, even if it's not exactly the way we'd want them to express themselves. So we kind of already got to some of this, but how do we discuss this skill with parents and caregivers or teachers, right? So a lot of times we're going to hear from them the concerning behavior. And so we want to guide them towards, well, if that's what you're concerned about, how can we flip that into a behavior that we can name for our child, right? So if we're really concerned that they keep name calling with their siblings, well, what do we want them to do? We want them to use I statements and express how they feel, right? And then think, think about when is the child likely to show even a step in the right direction on this? Right. So oftentimes if it's not following direction, well, the opportunity to do that then would be when they're given a direction or instruction and then ask them really specifically, how are you going to praise them? And again, in a way that's authentic and culturally attuned to that context. Right. Um, sometimes it can be verbal and sometimes it can be paired with nonverbal. Because when we plan when and how we're going to look for behavior and respond to a behavior, it sort of primes us to be more likely to do that. And so we have some resources that we want to share with you all. Um, here are some really nice brief videos that um, the San Jose State Health Development Clinic came out with, and they have this in English and Spanish. So these can be helpful to watch with your families in the office. They're really brief or pass the links along. And then we also came out with this handout um, that kind of guides through the steps and the main points that we just talked about. So the, the second strategy we want to talk about is special time, sometimes called quality time or time in. Um, and it can be one of the first strategies that can really turn these negative adult-child interaction cycles on their head. And so if a child can reliably count on special quality time with an adult, it may reduce their, their attention-seeking behaviors in less desirable ways, right? Um, and so ideally, this is scheduled and sacred. So it's not something that they earn for good behavior. It's something they can just count on every day, even if it's just five minutes. What's key is that it's given with undivided, uninterrupted attention, right? So not when our phones are out or we're doing other things, but really when we have time to give our full focus, again, even if it's just for five minutes. And it's helpful if it's an activity that the youth is actually interested in, ideally not something with screens or technology or competitive games, but something that could be like art or even just taking a walk or talking in a car ride, right? But on a conversation that the youth is directing. And this really functions like money in the bank, right? Because if they're getting our attention, they know they can count on it. They may be less likely to act out to try and get our attention. Um, so these are some, some resources for talking about special time in with your families. There's a really nice guide from the child mind. And then we came up with um, a handout to help parents identify like, when could I do this throughout the week? Um, what are some activities that might be helpful to do this with? And in terms of talking about this strategy, uh, this is a recommendation from our team member, uh, Dr. Young, who couldn't be here today because she's, I believe, at AAP. Uh, but she likes to bring up the Incredible Years Pyramid, which we have a link to here. And as you can see on this pyramid, the bottom two rows 
um, are really what we're talking about today. And so on the pyramid, the parenting strategies are in yellow and the benefits are in the, the colors on the side. And at the bottom of the pyramid, here are where we're going to use these strategies the most liberally. And so you can see here, we've got that listening, talking, play that's involved in special time, and then the praise, right? And notice how the benefits of these are Increasing attachment, self-esteem, cooperation, problem solving, all things that really help reduce frustration and problem behaviors. And then praise up here on this next level really increases motivation and, and social skills. So some communication pearls of how to bring this up. Um, a great analogy is saying, like, think of your best bosses. Like, what made them the best? right? And try to bring out for them, well, they gave me positive reinforcement. They gave me really clear expectations and then signals when I was needing that. And then you can kind of have a conversation about, think about a boss that you didn't like very much. And did you want to work hard for that boss? Did you want to follow, you know, their guidelines as much as the boss you really like, who you had that positive relationship with? And that resonates with a lot of folks. Um, this is Lindsay's Pearl, uh, which I really like, right? That most kids are really, they want to do their best. They just might not have the skills or the scaffolding they need to get there. And so by providing these positive strategies, we're sort of giving them a roadmap to be able to be successful. Other thoughts or questions, or um, I loved the questions and thoughts about talking about praise. Any thoughts or questions about talking about special time? I have a question. Um, I've mentioned special time to a lot of families over the years, and I and it, I've never gotten like a resounding like, yes, we're going to do this, like. It's, it seems like the parent kind of takes it in and it doesn't really, I don't know if it really goes anywhere. And maybe that just might be how I'm talking about it, how I'm setting it up. But I'm curious if you know people have had that sort of, you know, flat response and if there might be some suggestions for how to really, maybe you've been giving all these suggestions already, but you know, how to make it really stick. Great question. Thanks, Tiffany. Does anyone in our group have any thoughts about that? I, um, that's a great point. I don't know if I've encountered it ex exactly that way, but I think sometimes people do seem a little skeptical, right? Cause they're coming, it's very like problem oriented. And so one way in the same way that we're I'm trying to empower them to give their kids choices, like framing it, like, you know, we don't want to have every time you guys have one of these conversations, like to be all negative or cause something bad happened. And so kind of framing it in like that preventive way of like dedicating this time to do something nice and make them um, feel seen, wanted, heard, right, can help reduce some of those other more stressful, uh, you know, times where we might talk about consequences and things like that. Um, that can help. And then just exploring, like, what's gotten in the way before or how their kids responded and, and problem solving with them a little bit. I've definitely had the same problem as you, Tiffany. And I think it usually, I try to figure out which of two reasons for that. One is like, are they not bought into the rationale for this? And so I might spend some time talking about like the foundation of a relationship is what makes us what kind of going back to that boss's question of like, usually a strong relationship makes us want to do better. Um, or is it that they're having trouble scheduling it in or remembering it? And then I might be taking the tack of like trying to tie it to another daily behavior that already exists, like maybe doing this before bedtime or before teeth brushing or something like that. I know that it is harder in like a primary care setting where you're not seeing people frequently so that you can follow up. Cause we know that assigning, if we assign homework, the best way to um, not get people to do their homework is to not follow up about it. And so our different settings kind of lend themselves to different ways, but I would use those two strategies personally. And I love this suggestion from Lyra in the chat here of actually writing it like a prescription um, or like, you know, saying it like homework or this is your assignment, you know, whatever feels culturally attuned to that, to that person. Um Let's see what else is coming through here in the chat. Um, I also sometimes will talk about that if if you do these strategies first, then the other strategies that they might be like ready to go to, like removal of privileges or consequences, um, you're going to 
those are going to be set up better because we've already tackled some of the foundation in these. I think someone else was going to say something. Uh, this is me. And I was just going to say this was actually um, many years ago when my kids were really young and um, someone had said to me something about special time and I just flat out didn't want to hear it. I was like, I'm barely making it through the day. I, what do you mean special time? Um, and so the suggestion was made that I just say yes one time throughout the day. And um, and I was able to say yes to one thing, even if it was, you know, can I have my breakfast now, mum? Yes. And then I was like, oh, okay. And that really helped for me. It was just a personal, oh, okay. I I don't have to keep on saying no, no, no. That's I was always starting everything with a no answer. Um, and um, yes, opened up special time for me personally in a oh, I can just sit down and just say, hey, come and have a cuddle with me. And then as they got older, tell me something that's going on with you and we can have that special time. So I was really thankful for just that little seed of just say yes one time through the day. Start with a yes and not a no. Um, I don't know if that will help. Yeah, I love that strategy. So have it be in response to something their youth is asking, say yes, or tie it to something you're already doing. So you're not adding in another activity. You're just really making sure that during an activity, you're giving your child your full attention. Like I personally do it with my daughter at bath time. We already have to do bath time. So I might as well make that a time when I'm really keyed into paying attention to her and, and giving her that special one-on-one -on -one time. And I really like what um, Marielle said in the chat about sometimes first parents just need a little bit of venting and to be heard and to be validated before they're ready to jump into trying something new. Does the personality of the parent and the child interfere with this approach? Personality conflict play a role? That's an interesting question. I think, you know, the research shows that this strategy tends to be effective. Um, I don't know if I've seen anything come out like specifically indicating or contraindicating it based on personality things. I do think that when a cycle has gotten in a really negative spot and it's been that way for a long time, um, it can be hard. It's harder to get out of. Um, and so mm -hmm. if the, a personality conflict's been happening for a while, even just giving this a try can seem like a challenge. Sorry, someone was going to say something. Well, I think that you, there is a concept that you might be referring to of like goodness of fit of parenting and how sometimes parent temperament and kid temperament may be a harder match. And so these strategies might be even more necessary than they were in the same family for a different child. And I think that can be a helpful way to kind of explain why they may need to make this extra effort with this other kid without blaming the child or the caregiver. That's a great point. Any other thoughts or questions before we get into talking about a case? <laughs> 